I can't do anything. You, can you see me? Yes. I, I can't. Three seconds. Just there you go. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, if uh, members are content to proceed through the agenda, um, can I welcome uh, members to the sixth meeting of the audit committee? If members are content, uh, we'll proceed to apologies. The clerk has not received apologies from any member for today's meeting, uh, and uh, a number of members have indicated that they intend to participate uh, in the meeting via Starleaf. Um, can I remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests before and during each committee meeting? Um, could, has any member present any interest to declare? No? Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, can I refer members to uh, draft minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of October 2020, which are pages 6 to 10 of the meeting pack? Okay. And uh, if members uh, are content uh, with the minutes? Content. Content. Okay. Can I ask uh, Clarita to update members on the latest information in relation to the draft budgets 2021-2022 for uh, the three non-ministerial bodies, please? And. Uh, Okay. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, it's still anticipated the spending review is going to be announced today. Um, the outcome will be expected from um, shortly thereafter, and DOF intend to send comments through to this committee um, for incorporation into the draft committee report um, at the start of next week. Um, the, at that point, then, the committee could um, incorporate those into the draft report, which will be considered at a meeting thereafter. And I'll, the committee office will inform members if and when that comment is received to allow us to schedule a meeting. Okay, thank you. Is that anticipated before Christmas? The report yeah. would anticipate um, there's a potential date for the 9th of December. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's in, yeah. All right, Jim, content, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I uh, ask the Secretary to circulate correspondence from the Speaker of the Assembly in relation to the commencement of Part 3 of the Public Service Ombudsman Act uh, to enable NIPSO to exercise a complaint standards authority role? Uh, this letter was received after table packs were issued. Uh, therefore, members may wish to note this pending uh, more substantial consideration at a future committee meeting. Can I ask if anyone has any other matters arising from the minutes of the last meeting? I'm content. Okay. Um, can I remind members um, that this session is being recorded by Hansard and refer members to the research paper on uh, public audit governance at 5.1, which is pages 13 to 39 of the members' packs? And can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring Emma Dallow Perry into the spotlight, please? Hi. Now, um. Hi, are you, Emma? You're very welcome um, uh, to brief members. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I, we drafted the report to respond to some quite specific uh, questions from the committee, so they have necessarily focused on those subjects. So uh, anything extra you want to know, we can, of course, look into and get back to you on. Um, but the first question that was raised was basically uh, about the background to the reform and the sort of policy rationale and how these changes were taken forward. So to start at the beginning, um, there was a, a general background of reform of public appointments following on from the mid 90s. Um, and of course, devolution had taken place, which was changing the responsibilities of the National Audit Office. But the real spur to reform came when there was some negative media coverage of the Comptroller and Auditor General's expenses. And that prompted the Public Accounts Commission to commission the Tyner Report, which was eventually published in 2008. And that reviewed the governance and the sort of terms and conditions of the Auditor General's employment, uh, or rather position, and um, was then, as I say, published in 2008 and prompted an immediate reform of his expenses, which were tagged to permanent secretaries. Uh, and then the 
Public Accounts Commission created some draft clauses, which were broadly uh, accepted, um, and proposals where legislation was planned for 2010. Um, that was removed before the May election, and it was brought back as the Budget um, uh, Audit Responsibility Act in 2011. So that was how they ended up with reform of the NAO. That same act contained powers for the Welsh administration um, to allow them to carry through their reform. So brief bit of background on uh, the Auditor General for Wales. That office was created during the devolution settlement. It was Its powers were expanded in 2006 and reform ultimately along the lines of the Tyner Report, took place in 2013. Again, media coverage, negative media coverage, was the spur to, uh, to actual reform. Um, and this, there was a report by the Welsh Finance Committee in 2011, which covered the issues in some depth. Um, but the reform took place in the Public Audit Wales Act of 2013. And that was based on the sort of legislative background to that was that expansion of power in the 2011 Act from Westminster. But that was all it was. Um, so that, again, that, that created a body, uh, an Auditor General, very much along the lines of the Tyner Report, but based on a different review. Um, in Scotland, it was a much more proactive report, uh, proactive reform, I beg your pardon. Uh, the Scots devolution model, they were required to set up their, their public audit structures. Um, they did so in the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act of 2000, um, which sets up the office and the auditor. This was ultimately reformed following a report from the Scottish Commission for Public Audit, which is more or less equivalent to the Audit Committee. Um, and that that had been requested by Audit Scotland as part of this sort of 10 years into devolution, looking again at the structures and um, the governance. And that eventually became the, was incorporated into the 2010 Act, uh, which was a much wider act, but did reform the Office of the Auditor General as well. So that, between the, the, the sort of three other um, nations in the UK, the, what sets Scotland apart is that very proactive element of it, uh, element of their reform, whereas in, in Wales and for the NAO they were responding to governance failures. So the reforms themselves, specifically we were asked to comment on um, the background and rationale on tenure. So tenure was quite interesting. First of all, the mandatory retirement age that accompanied the lifetime appointment was not... Every body agreed that... The, <laughs> sorry, every public body agreed that did not comply with uh, European legislation on age discrimination. So that just disappeared entirely and that, that was agreed upon by, by all of them. Um, there's no opportunity for reappointment following the reforms. That, that, again, there wasn't much dispute over that. It was considered as a sensible maneuver to, present, to prevent um, improper pressure on the Auditor General. Uh, the period of tenure, across the UK, it's between eight and 10 years. It's 10 years in Westminster, eight years in Scotland and Wales. And that, the, the reasons they arrived at that, um, at that number all, are, are all pretty similar in that the feeling was that eight to ten years gives uh, the occupant of the office enough time to really get to grips with the role, to start long-term projects and to bring in changes if necessary. If you've got a period that's longer than that, there, it, the general feeling was that there would be a risk that the people would get complacent, that there would be too much influence for one person to have, and so on and so forth. So uh, a period of eight to 10 years, non-renewable, was what everyone settled on. Um, it was, and again, of course, the Auditor General can be removed by a vote, uh, a 
the relevant legislature. Um, but that's, I think in most cases, it's a weighted majority of about two thirds. Um, so that dealt with the, uh, the retirement age. When it comes to the current governance structure, um, so this is quite a, a detailed subject. I, I don't want to bore the committee with a recitation of who does what <laughs> across three separate offices. But just as a, as a broad overview, all of the reformed uh, offices have a similar structure where you've got the, the Comptroller and Auditor General um, and you've got the board. The board is the, the body that they talk about in the legislation. The official name for what we call the board is Audit Scotland or Audit Wales. Um, and they do, they employ all the staff, provide the resources to the CAG to carry out his or her work. And that board is composed of a blend of non-executive um, directors. In Wales, they have employee members. And then you've, obviously you've got your controller and auditor general and the chairperson. There is a, a table at, in your papers at 4.1, I believe, which should lay out the differences between each one, but broadly it's the same structure. Um, the board then will agree with the Comptroller and Auditor General a code of practice or a term, a, some call it terms of reference. And that lays out in some detail the relationship between the auditor and the board. And this code is then approved by the parliamentary committee responsible for oversight. So in, in the case of the NAO, it's the Public Accounts Commission. In Scotland, it's the Scottish Commission for Public Audit, and so on and so forth. Um, as far as I could tell, in Northern Ireland, the, the code appears to be approved by the, by the Comptroller and Auditor General and not by the committee. But I wasn't able to find anything that definitely said that, just said the code is, is, uh, is approved by the Comptroller and Auditor General. Um, so the code then will contain a provision to establish an audit committee and the audit committee would carry out a lot of the functions that we would think of when we talk about challenge governance functions. It will sit alongside the human resources committee and the remuneration committee but it does the, the sort of governance functions that we would be concerned about or the committee would be concerned about. Um, and that would include things like internal for audit, value for money challenges, actually pulling together the reports, um, all, all of that, that that you would expect. And there's more detail laid out on that, because as I say, it's, it's quite a, an in-depth topic. Um, so there's more detail on that in the appendix, in appendix two, I believe. Yeah. Um, and that will show you in some, in some detail how the committees spend their time and what they do and uh, what their sort of founding documents are. So um, the next question that we were asked to deal with was uh, the accuracy of audit and how the board obtains external sort of validation of the quality of audit. Um, so that's, it's really done in a number of ways. It's a common theme that the board can appoint auditors to assess whether or not the, the audits are being carried out well. That's in all of the revised codes. Um, but there are also other structures like um, internal review structures or internal review teams who have a degree of independence. Uh, they're either separate teams or they're set aside in some way, but they're not what you'd call strictly external auditors. Um, and in the Wales, uh, in the Wales annual report for 2019-20, they did set aside specific funding for auditors to come in and look at the quality of audit. So it, it's it's done and it does happen, and it appears to be the or the board that uh, actually appoints the auditors in question. Um, but they also have, as I say, that they have those internal. Uh, review mechanisms, there are also external auditors, for example, the Financial Reporting Committee, uh, and they comply, uh, the, the audit offices themselves will list the types of standards they comply with when conducting their audits, so your, your ISOs and your um, 
the Institute of Chartered Accountants for the relevant jurisdiction and so on and so forth. Um, and in Audit Wales, it used to be that the Assistant Auditor General was responsible to the Auditor General for audit quality, but that seems to be in the process of changing. Um, so that does audit quality. Uh, in terms of the additional powers of the parliamentary committees following reform, it seems to be that they're more involved in certain things like the appointment of the chair of the board, um, the appointment of the board members themselves. Uh, in, for the NAO, they, when they appoint, they, they can appoint auditors, but the NAO, the board actually has the right to advise the auditors. Um, and, that, and where they have those more detailed powers, um, you see a sort of, it, it's generally about the, the appointment of members of the board and the ability to scrutinize uh, the governance of the office themselves. Um, but those reforms are, are now sort of being reformed as well. So for example, where you've got um, it, in Wales and in Scotland, you have slightly different quorum requirements for the board. Uh, Wales, they, they are thinking of switching to the Scottish model. And in Scotland, they're thinking of switching to the Welsh model. Um, <laughs> and uh, Wales, for example, have, is undergoing a further reform, which, oh yes, um, they're allowing them to export, uh, allowing Audit Wales to export, or sorry, export, appoint um, its own external auditors, uh, because with the tripartite contracting arrangements that they have in place at the minute, it gets quite complex. So they want the right to appoint their own. So that's an, uh, there are quite advanced uh, further reforms being considered at the minute, which might be of interest to the committee because they're, they're obviously taking a look at what they've done and, um, and seeing how they can do it better. Um, so the only other thing that I was asked about was the extent to which statutory boards exercise a challenge function in relation to their uh, auditor generals or their respective auditor generals. And that's, it, it's, it's an interesting question to answer because there's an element of subjectivity in, in it. Um, so what I've done is in Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 sort of combined, tried to answer that question. Um, I, all I can really show you are the additional points at which governance can now take place. It's not, it, it, it's a bit more challenging to assess how well they, they exercise that challenge function, but there are more points of governance, more stops along the way, if you will. So to the extent that those are there, governance can said to be improved. Um, and that is more or less, that, that's a very sort of whistle-stop tour of it all, but um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, Emma, thank you very much for taking the time to carry out that research and for sharing that information with us. It is very helpful that we can compare to uh, other uh, devolved uh, administrations. And I think it's, um, it has been very helpful, particularly around the tenure as well and the differences that exist compared to here. Um, I just, I, I'm just, I heard Westminster was 10 years, Scotland was, eight, this was the CNAG, Westminster was 10 years, Scotland was 8 years, Wales was? 8, eight. I believe. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there's actually quite a nice, uh, the Scottish Comptroller and Auditor General give evidence to a committee, and I've included that evidence in full. It's at 2.3 in your, in your paper. And it's quite an interesting consideration of, of, of the, the issue because it's, you know, it's from the horse's mouth, um, but it does run through what was in their mind and why they ended up with where they did. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. And, and ju just around the retirement age, the retirement age at Northern, in Northern Ireland is set at 65, isn't it? Um, the CNAG. I'd have to check that. Yes, yeah, I, yeah, I, think, I think it is. Yeah. But, okay, uh, I'll open to uh, members. Uh, I'll just run the usual order. Uh, Joanne Bunting. Um. 
Um, yeah. Okay, Joab. Can you hear me, Daniel? Loud and clear. All right. Okay. Sorry. Um, right. Uh, Emma, thank you. Thank you very much um, for your for your presentation. Um, I read through some of the stuff last night. I suppose I'm interested to know. Um, it seems to me that whenever the other regions are looking, there's a there's a bigger input from their public accounts committees than we would have here. Um, and a lot of their public accounts committees seem to take on board the role that we have, except the role that we have is purely looking at their finances um, and, and their budgets and, and their value from money aspect. And, and what, what I noted from your research was that here, their quality assurance in terms of their internal processes and their internal governance and all of those issues are really done by their own audit and risk assurance committee. Is that is that a fair assessment, or you know, are, are those things also checked by their external auditors? Um, so that, that's a. I can give you a quick answer, um, but I might have to go away and get more detail on it for you. Um, the audit and risk assurance committee is common to all. Like when I was talking about the structure of the board before, they all have an equivalent of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. Um, mm. It would be fair to say that I think the, it, our, our committee does not have the same level of engagement um, with the output of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. Um, but that's not, a, that's not unique to Northern Ireland. Even in the Scottish report, the equivalent, our equivalent of the, their equivalent of our audit committee has said that they want the direct reports from the audit committee of the Scottish board. Um, but those things are, as far as I'm aware, those things are still being checked. There was, in the Northern Ireland uh, accounts, there was discussion about bringing in the, um, the, it, it, it's a, the, Sorry, it's the Institute for Accountants in England and Wales. I just can't remember the acronym. In that. Um, so there's discussion about bringing them to review those issues as well. Um, so, sorry, to, uh, to answer your question directly, yes, there is a difference in Northern Ireland in terms of how the value for money is assessed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's That's not, I, I, let me let me direct let me direct you. But um, essentially, what I'm trying to, to get to is, in the other regions, um, their quality assurance, not just of how they audit, mm -hmm. but of their internal governance and structures and whistleblowing and all of those things, mm -hmm. are not done internally by themselves, or are they? Um. You know, those are assessed by are, are those assessed by their external auditors. Whereas it struck me in this report that in the Northern Ireland Audit Office, that's done internally by their Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. Oh, yes, I do apologise. Yes, so the board appoint external auditors to do that elsewhere in the UK. Yes, but here they do it themselves. They they either bring in somebody or do it themselves. Yes, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, Joanne. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Joanne. Can I bring in uh, Emma Rogan, please? Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, can, Emma. Hi, Emma. Uh, Rick, thanks for your presentation um, this morning. Um, I'm probably following on a wee bit from um, Joanne's question. What input um, do audit committees and other jurisdictions have in determining the makeup of their um, advisory boards? It's just strange that we would appoint our own. You know, maybe that's what they do. If it, that, I'm not sure. So the committee the, would appoint the non-executive members of the advisory board, and depending on how the legislation is crafted. So it, in some there's a, a required balance to achieve a quorum, in some there's a, a, a minimum number. Um, but yes, the, the, the committee have much more input into the composition of the board elsewhere in the UK than we do in Northern Ireland. 
Okay. And in terms of that, so the advisory board's terms are referenced or approved then by the um, controller and auditor general. Is that the same in other jurisdictions or, you know, to me, it's just there's kind of a lack of independence and oversight in this. What's your view on that? Well, that that did strike me as a difference, um, that the code was approved by the committee. Um, but in Northern Ireland, it's, it seems to be approved by the Comptroller and Auditor General. Okay. That's all my questions on that, Daniel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emma. Uh, can broadcast and bring in Alan Chambers, please? Uh, Chair, I'm okay. I'm just playing catch up and apologies for coming into the meeting late. You're okay. You're very welcome, Alan. And uh, Jim Allister. Yeah, th thank you for your paper. It's um, very informative, well put together. Uh, but it really comes down to this. Within Northern Ireland, any supervisory role or oversight roles in-house, whereas elsewhere, it's, as you would expect, external. Is that, the, is that it in a, in a sentence? Um, certainly the much more or much more of the governance structure in um, the rest of the UK is done externally yes um, and a lot of what you would see in uh, elsewhere in the UK being done externally is done in house in Northern Ireland yeah. Yeah. to the very point that the controller and auditor general points the board appoints the chair uh, and they then um, sanction his work it does seem to be that way, although my understanding is the committee endorsed the selection of the Auditor General for yeah. chair. Yeah, yeah. Are there any international standards which create expectations about how these matters should be? I know that we have national... Oh, uh, sorry, specifically about the governance of public audit or about... Yes, governance. about public audit. I, I would have to look into that one, um, but I'm happy to take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Emma, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and thank you for taking our questions and for the time you spent doing that research. Very, very helpful. So thank okay. you again. Okay. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Uh, okay, members, we'll move to the next item of business. Can I remind members that this session has been recorded by Hansard and refer members to the research paper on governance and accountability arrangements for the offices of the Ombudsman in other legislators at 6.1, uh, pages 41 to 60 of the members' pack. And can I ask uh, Assembly Broadcasting to bring Georgina Ryan White into the spotlight, please? Hi, Georgina. Can you hear us okay? Yes, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much, and thank you for agreeing to be with us. Um, if you would like to give us a, a brief uh, outline, uh, if, if you could, Georgina, thanks very much. I'll, I'll try and be brief, I can't guarantee. Um, so, uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, the research I carried out looked at comparative accountability and governance arrangements the offices of the Ombudsman and the other UK legislatures. Uh, so to provide context and comparative information, the research looked at what arrangements, if any, there were and where do they originate from. Um, as you know, Scotland and Wales have unified public service ombudsmen. In England, there are a number of ombudsmen covering these services. However, uh, most relevant to the committee's query that I identified were the parliamentary and health service ombudsmen, the local government and social care ombudsmen which carry out similar enough roles. Um, so I'll briefly take you through the arrangements in each of the offices, but to quickly summarise, all of the individual ombudsmen are independent of government in the exercise of their functions, and they cannot be overruled by parliament, government ministers or committees. The offices are all accountable to their respective governments by the laying of annual reports and accounts before parliament, which are subject to scrutiny by individual government committees. Comparable features across the office's governance arrangements include audit and risk 
committees to advise on corporate governance and internal control um, and the designation of the ombudsman as the accounting officer in most of the offices uh, which is responsible for financial probity and regularity. Um, the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman has sought to increase his financial probity further by delegating his role as accounting officer to the office's chief executive. All of the offices are subject to internal and external auditing. Uh, so firstly to look at Scotland um, the Scottish Public Services Ombuds sorry the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman powers and duties derive from the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Act 2002 uh, they are nominated by the Scottish Parliament and appointed by the Queen for a period of no more than eight years in relation to accountability the Ombudsman is in the performance of her duties regarded as a juristic person and solely accountable for the conduct of the office she is independent and not in the exercise of her functions subject to any direction or control by the Scottish Government, Parliament or the Parliamentary Corporate Body. However, she is directly accountable to Parliament through the laying of an annual report and accounts. In addition, the 2002 Act requires the Ombudsman to lay a strategic plan before the Parliament every four years. Um, it is the practice of the Local Government and Communities Committee to scrutinise the work of the office and to take, uh, take evidence from the Ombudsman each year on its annual report. Uh, you will see in my paper that the committee has previously challenged uh, the quality sorry, qualitative analysis of information contained um, in the annual report. Um, so now moving on to governance, uh, the arrangements are based on a governance and risk overview and a scheme of control. Um, the governance overview features the ombudsman as the accountable as the accounting officer for the office and um, which is designated by and answerable to the scottish uh, parliamentary corporate body um, and there's also a process there for internal and external audit um, moving on to the scheme of internal control it is a series of protocols and policies through which the ombudsman aims to demonstrate that she is meeting her responsibilities as the ombudsman as the and as the accountable officer um, the key features of the scheme again are the ombudsman as the accountable officer um, the Ombudsman setting the strategic directions and priorities for the office supported by a leadership team um, with the Ombudsman chairing that leadership team. Um, the leadership team consists of the Ombudsman, the Chair and the Director Head of Information Standards and Engagement. Um, and it is responsible for supporting the Ombudsman and stating the strategic direction of the office um, and holding the office to account for its performance. Um, the Ombudsman has also established an advisory audit board to perform a function similar to that of an audit committee and um, its main purpose is to advise the Ombudsman, the leadership team um, on the office's standards of corporate governance and internal control. These um, governance arrangements, they can only be amended with the Ombudsman approval and um, the Ombudsman must inform the advisory audit board and external auditors of any changes. In addition, the Ombudsman must review these governance arrangements annually and report the outcome to the advisory audit board. Um, so now moving on to Wales. Um, the Public Service Ombudsman for Wales was originally established in 2015. Um, and is now um, under the direction of the Public Services Ombudsman Wales Act 2019, which sets out the terms of the Ombudsman appointment and statutory function. Um, so I think that, sorry, apologies, that should be originally established um, in 2015, sorry, I believe. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that anyway. Um, so the Ombudsman is appointed uh, by the Queen following nomination from the National Assembly for a term of seven years and they can only be removed if they, became, if they become capable of performing their duties for medical reasons or on grounds of misbehaviour. Um, funding, interestingly enough, for the offices received from the National Assembly for Wales, and um, the Ombudsman is required to produce estimates for each financial year for the resources required to carry out his statutory functions. These are scrutinised and consulted on by the Assembly's Finance Committee, which then issues a report with its finding. Um, so turning to accountability, the Ombudsman um, is corporation sole, so a legal entity in its own right. Um, although independent of government, of government um, it does have statutory responsibilities to report directly to the Welsh Assembly by again publishing and laying an annual report and counts. Um, the Equality Local Government and Committees Community scrutinises the Ombudsman work, including the annual report and accounts. Um, it will also 
periodically, uh, sorry, the Public Accounts Committee also periodically scrutinises the Office's use of resources. Um, you will note that the committee's scrutiny of the 2017-18 accounts uh, in my paper, uh, which contains some robust recommendations, which opened up some frank uh, dialogue and response with the Ombudsman. Um, so the office's main governance arrangements centre on an advisory board and an audit and risk assurance committee supported by a governance framework and internal and external audit arrangements. Um, again, the ombudsman is the accounting officer for uh, is the accounting officer for the office, which requires him to ensure that the office is operating to a high standard um, of probity. Um, the ombudsman has established an advisory panel to advise him on matters of policy. Um, and good governance. It consists of six independent members and the Ombudsman. It is a non-statutory forum whose main role is to provide support and advice in providing leadership and setting the strategic objectives of the office. Um, it is an advisory only body and responsibility therefore and accountability for the government for the activities of the um, of the office remain with the Ombudsman. Uh, prior to the introduction of the 2015 sorry, 2005 Act, uh, which originally created the Ombudsman, um, the Welsh Government consultation asked whether there should be some formal mechanisms for advising the Ombudsman um, and whether it should have a statutory advisory board. The Act did not provide for this um, because the general view among Ombudsmen was that um, any such board should be set up on a voluntary and non-statutory basis um, and as any such advisory board would compromise the independence of the office. Um, the Audit and Risk Com Committee provides independent advice in relation to the Ombudsman Responsibility Accounting Officer uh, and the integrity of the financial statements and the annual report. Membership consists of six independent members. Following a review of the governance arrangements in 2018, the terms of reference of the committee were actually amended, so it is now a standalone committee rather than a subcommittee of the advisory board. Um, and also, Internal and external auditors have the right to raise issues through an open access policy um, to the chair and therefore to bring any matters of concern um, to the attention of the committee. Um, so moving on to England now, and firstly, the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. Um, the two statutory roles of Parliamentary Commissioner for Administration and Health Service Commissioner for England are vested in one individual post as the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. Um, they are appointed by the Queen for a maximum term of seven years. And the Chief Executive and Director of Legal and Professional Services are authorised by the Ombudsman to act as Deputy Ombudsman. Um, again, the Ombudsman has a personal jurisdiction and is solely accountable for the work carried out by the office. Um, he is independent and cannot be overruled by governors, government ministers or committees in the exercise of his functions. Um, However, again, the Ombudsman has statutory responsibilities to report directly to Parliament through the presentation of its annual report and accounts to the House of Commons. Um, the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee is the principal, principal liaison mechanism with the Ombudsman. It scrutinises the work of the offices, in particular the annual report, um, which it does so by launching an annual scrutiny inquiry, and um, you can find that on its website. Um, the Ombudsman also appears before the committee to give um, evidence, usually following the publication of its annual report and accounts. Um, in 2018, following a recommendation from the committee, the office commissioned an independent peer review to examine its ability to secure value for money in the course of its work. Um, you will note from the excerpt in my paper that the peer that a peer review peer review uh, mechanism is a relatively uh, new uh, process in the ombudsman sector, and several countries are as several countries are considering how best to evaluate ombudsman's offices effectively. Um, a number of written submissions um, to the peer review actually criticised the membership of the panel as being insufficiently independent as it contained two ombudsmen and an academic expert um, who was formerly employed by the uh, Scottish public sector ombudsman. However, the committee had no concerns about the panel's independence uh, or integrity and actually recommended for the office to repeat the process every three to four years. Um, it, has, it has suggested that future reviews um, should also consider how best to reach outside the ombudsman sector um, to, uh, to obtain informed perspectives from professional peers um, which have relevant experience in the relevant sectors. Um, so turning to the current governance arrangements for the office. Um, the office relies on challenge and assurance from the accounting 
officer, uh, the non-statutory unitary board, um, and an audit and risk assurance um, committee. Um, instead of retaining the role of accountable officer, the current ombudsman has actually delegated that responsibility um, to the chief executive, um, and he has described this um, change um, and this this new process, uh, this this new delegation as a contractual responsibility that allows him to have a separate accountable person um, in his office. Um, so this off so the office is governed is governed by this non statutory unitary decision making board. Um, it contains three executives and nine non executives, um, but is chaired by the ombudsman. Um, again, describing the arrangements in the two thousand nineteen annual report, the ombudsman said. Being a corporation so with a personal jurisdiction is not consistent with modern requirements of good governance. Therefore, I am the chair of a unitary board which is in place to improve the governance of the office. Uh, he reserves the right, uh, given a statutory role um, and independence, to depart from the board's decision, but only in, cer in exceptional circumstances and when he puts his, re his reasons in writing. Um, there is also an audit and risk committee which oversees um, the corporate governance and control systems. Um, it scrutinizes the quarterly governance reports and the committee can seek additional assurances, sorry, assurances about the governance and risk arrangements, including requesting internal and uh, internal audit reports and assurance reviews into specific areas of risk. And finally, moving to the local government and social care ombudsman. Um, the Commission for Local Administration in England is the independent statutory body to create, sorry, to operate the local government and social care ombudsman scheme. Um, the functions um, of the Commission are set out in the Local Government Act 1974 and are elaborated further in a framework document agreed um, with its sponsor department, um, which is communities and local government. And the ombudsman is appointed by the Queen uh, for a period not exceeding seven years. Uh, they may be removed from office at their own request or on grounds of capacity or misbehaviour. Um, interestingly, it's a bit more complicated here. The ombudsman um, simultaneously holds the role as chair of the commission. Um, so the ombudsman is independent of government and parliament in all matters relating to the exercise of his functions. However, um, as with the others, he has a statutory obligation uh, to present his annual report and accounts before Parliament. Um, in his role as chair of the Commission, the Ombudsman is responsible for ensuring that the Commission fulfills the statutory purpose and that its affairs are conducted with probity. Uh, provide. However, um, in this respect, therefore, the chair is accountable to the Secretary of State in his role as chair of the Commission, but not in his exercise and of his personal authority as a local government ombudsman. Um, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government plays a specific sponsorship role for the office. The details are, which are set out in this framework document. Um, and the Commission is required to review the operation of its leg legislative framework every three years. Um, in its last report in 2018, it recommended that the current accountability framework and sponsorship uh, arrangement should be reviewed um, so that the Ombudsman becomes more directly accountable to Parliament for the exercise of its statutory functions. Um, so now moving on, um, the Commission for Local Administration um, operates as the board of the Ombudsman scheme. It sets the annual business plan and annual budget. Uh, it consists of a chairman, three independent advisory members and one ex officio member who is actually the parliamentary and health service ombudsman. Um, in turn, the work, the board's work is scrutinised by the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee and the remun sorry, Remuneration and Appointments Committee of the Commission. Um, the Audit and Risk Assurance um, Committee adheres to the scope um, Dear, sorry, to the model and, and guidance set out um, in the audit committee handbook published by um, the Treasury. There are three independent members, one of whom is appointed as the chair. Um, the permanent secretary has actually um, appointed the chief executive as counting officer for the commission. Um, and then again, 
the government's arrangements are set out in the framework document agreed between the Ombudsman and the Ministry. However, this document um, does not convey any legal powers or responsibilities um, onto either, and any amendments to the framework document must be agreed by the Secretary of State and uh, the Treasury following a process of consultation with the Commission. Um, in 2013, the Commission's governance arrangements were the subject of an independent uh, review. Um, it found that the 1974 Act required re reviewing and modernising at the earliest opportunity. Um, and as a result, um, the government published the draft Public Services Ombudsman Bill in 2016, um, setting out the details of a uh, new Public Services Ombudsman and by consolidating the responsibilities of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman, the local government ombudsman. Um, however, this bill has never actually been introduced. Um, the, the response from the government is that it will be introduced when parliamentary time allows. In the meantime, the Ombudsman has taken um, his own approach to addressing the anomalies uh, within the current legislative um, parameters and has embedded a greater split of responsibilities between the role of the Ombudsman and the Chief Executive um, and Accounting Officer and has also appointed independent members to the board. Um, so that's essentially a whistle stop tour um, through and I'm happy to take any questions or um, see if I can elaborate any further. Georgina, thank you. Uh, yeah, Georgina, thank you very much for um, that presentation and the huge amount of research obviously that you've done uh, into uh, other areas and, 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 and this one as well and it, it, it's, it's very, very informative, very helpful um, uh, for the review that this committee is carrying out. Um, if you're agreed, we'll, we'll take some questions from uh, other members. And uh, again, in the same order, I ask broadcasting to bring in Joanne Bunting, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Georgina. There's a there's a lot in that. Um, so, in a, in a couple, as far as I understand, then in a couple of the regions, um, the Ombudsman has essentially delegated responsibility for scrutiny, for want of a better word, to the chief executive of the organisation, which has potential to bring them into conflict. And also, but the chief executive are permanent posts, and the Ombudsman's posts are timely. Words. Yes, all good so far. Sorry, would you be able to repeat that? Sorry, you bro you broke up there for me. Sorry. Sorry, I I'm just trying to ascertain. So, in a number of the regions, um, the Ombudsman has delegated responsibility for some level of scrutiny to the Chief Executive, who presumably is a permanent post. Yes? Uh, well, it, it, that would be more um, in England with the parliamentary um, health ombudsman. Um, he has delegated his role as accounting officer, which looks at the financial scrutiny and ensuring that financial um, affairs of the office um, are, are appropriate and meet the appropriate standard. So he has delegated that um, in the local government ombudsman in England. That that was that appointment has been made by the Secretary of State. Um, so that that that's that's an existing right. mechanism. And um, while it's the Parliamentary Health Ombudsman himself who has taken that um, step himself to delegate. Um, but there is there's delegation powers within. Um, the ombudsman that they can delegate certain roles. So, um, it's that is in that. So, so if I can just move on to, you see, for me, there's two types of quality assurance. There's quality assurance for their work, and then there's quality assurance for their governance structures and arrangements, right? Um, and it seems, again, in, in these circumstances, by and large, those are scrutinised by an audit and risk committee. Could you just clarify for me with regard to their audit and risk committees? I know that there's a number of independent members. Um, so how, how are those, do those people form part of a board? What's the tenure for those people? Um, you know, are, are there criteria for their appointments? Um, no, I, I'd have to get back to you know, on the exact mechanisms um but you'll note um in my paper there um in relation to the welsh ombudsman you'll see that its committee um 
uh, its committee, sorry, I always get the exact thing, uh, made some recommendations. And yes. Deal with the point. Um, they should appoint uh, an external member. And the, the Ombudsman actually did go on to do that. Um, so, yes. Um, but as a, I mean, for example, in Wales, um, so so they spotted a weakness and decided to close the gap. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one independent member. Sorry, just refresh my memory. Out of how many? Uh, sorry, I think. Um, I have to get back to you on that. Um, it's six independent external members. So six external um, members. And then somebody from outside the Auburn Risk Committee. Yes. Okay. Well, did you, just finally, Chairman, I'll not prolong this, but was there anything that you noted um, in terms of your search and your compare and contrast, Georgina, that appeared a stark difference um, and something that stood out as a stark weakness in the accountability mechanisms? Um, it's, it's very much a balance. Um, you can see with the accountability of ensuring the independence of the Ombudsman um, with accountability um, that the, the legislatures are trying to achieve. Um, what I find probably most interesting was if you look at England, that, that um, idea of the peer review, um, which um, in that specific case, it was looking at whether the, the Ombudsman was securing value for money. Um, but I was doing a bit of sort of background uh, looking into this peer review um, and sort of it's a it's a learning mechanism for the Ombudsman um, and encourages growth um, through learning. Um, but it can also look um, it can also be used if they feel um, they have not encountered external stimulus such as a political um, or a c public call for assessment of your value um, and what you're doing. So I, I find that quite interesting as sort of another way of looking um, and of looking at the committee and trying to encourage them with their own growth and learning through peer, peer, peer review, if, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Um, Emma Rogan, can, can broadcast and bring Emma Rogan into Spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, I just have one um, question, Georgina. Um, the Welsh Public Services Ombudsman and the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman in England both have non-statutory advisory boards. Mm -hmm. um, the Health Service has an additional scrutiny role. Is, would a similar setup here with our own Public Services Ombudsman provide an additional level of scrutiny? Um, sorry, sorry. In, in in what sense? Sorry, they, you know, the health service board in particular seems to have an additional scrutiny role, um, that that can depart from the, the any other of the rest of the board's decisions. So it's something similar. So the, that's the parliamentary health ombudsman. While he has that board, um, he can. He can decide himself not to go with the decision of the board, so that's him retaining his his independence. Um, so the thing with the the Welsh government, uh, sorry, with the Welsh ombudsman and the English, sorry, the parliamentary health, is that these are they're non statutory advice giving, but the responsibility ultimately remains. Um, with the exercise of the functions with the ombudsman himself, right. they're there to provide additional scrutiny, assurance, um, advice. But it's not a statutory obligation on him to to go at the to go at the advice. It, okay. It's more um, they've described it as to to encourage collective decision making, um, and that yes, basically and good no, man, no man can be an island, and it's it's trying to ensure it's again it's finding that balance of collective decision making, but ensuring that the ombudsman retains his his independence okay. with his ultimate exercise functions. Okay, Emma. 
Yep, perfect, thanks, Chair. Um, broadcasting, can you bring in Alan Chambers, please? Hi, hey, Alan. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank the officer for her presentation. I certainly found it very informative, contained a lot of detail, and certainly a report that will require careful reflection. But uh, no questions at this time, but thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks, Alan. And uh, Jim Allister? Yeah, uh, the paper is very good in terms of setting out uh, the arrangements in the other jurisdictions. but. Could you provide a table or an analysis comparing and contrasting what exists for governance supervision in Northern Ireland with what exists elsewhere? Okay, that, that, that's no problem. Um, the, the remit of the paper was just the other legislatures, but no, I'm, I'm happy to go away and prepare that for the committee. I think that, I think that would be useful to us going forward. To, to at a glance see where the differences are in terms of governance. No problem, I can, I can do that, surely. Thank you, uh, Jim and Georgina. Thank you uh, very much on behalf of the committee for the work you've carried out, and no doubt we'll be uh, in touch again and uh, for the presentation you give today and for answering the questions we have. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, if uh, members are agreed, there may be uh, some merit in publishing uh, the information that we've received today on the committee's review on the committee's review on our on the web pages. Um, with uh, the agreement of this committee, uh, could we create a page for the review on the committee's web pages, which could include links to the terms of reference, any research papers presented to the committee uh, in relation to the review, and copies of Hansard transcripts of oral evidence taken by the committee in connection with the review. All agree? Great. Okay. okay. Um, can I seek an agreement to move on to closed session, please? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we are now uh, back uh, in public session. Joanne rejoins us. Yes, Joanne is now there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I remind members that the, the session is being recorded by Hansard and refer members to the NIPSO annual report and accounts for 2019-20 at pages 66 uh, to 133. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our witnesses and thank them for attending today uh, to represent NIPSO. Uh, witnesses are Margaret Kelly. You're very welcome, Margaret. NIPSO, Paul McFadden, Deputy of NIPSO, and John McGinnity, Director of Finance, who will be joining us on Saturday. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good to see you again. You're very welcome back to Thank the you. committee. Uh, and uh, if you would uh, keep your, your statements as brief as possible, and uh, that will allow room for questions. Okay. okay. Thank you, Margaret, if you want to. Off. Thank you, and it's lovely to see everybody again. Um, and thank you for the opportunity for you to consider the annual report and accounts which were led before the Assembly on the 4th of November, and which I'm now happy to discuss with the committee. Um, they have been prepared in line with guidance from Department of Finance and in compliance with account of principles and disclosure requirements. Um, it's divided into three separate components, the performance report, the accountability report, and the financial statements. And, um, Daniel, if you will allow, yeah. I will briefly outline elements of the first two and then ask John just to take you briefly through some of the financial elements, if that's OK. And um, I have kept it fairly brief. So the performance report provides that overview of what we do, our underpinning values, our overall strategic purpose, um, as well as reporting on how we've delivered to our KPIs. And we have previously discussed some of those areas with the committee, so I'm not going to go over them, but I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions. Um, we have continued to perform well, with more than making KPIs 1 and 2. Our KPI 3 is below target, but I would put this in the context of that 32% increase in the number of investigations for completion at that stage, and also would say that last year represented the highest number of cases um, closed at that investigation stage since NIPSO's inception. Um, so we are working very hard on that. In terms of the accountability report, 
The accountability report covers our corporate governance report and our governance statement, and the committee will see that it sets out, I think, in some detail between the age, pages 18 and 29, the governance structure and the arrangements for NIPSO, and I hope that that may actually be of some assistance to the committee mm -hmm. in their review. Um, I will draw your attention in particular to the figure one on page 20, which represents diagrammatically the accountability arrangements with the Assembly Audit Committee as the primary focus um, for that. We further included the membership of and attendance of meetings by Audit and Risk Committee, um, and the minutes of those meetings are on the website. And in addition to considering a number of standard items around our performance and our risk and accountability, the committee also consider the findings of assurance-based audit reports, which are prepared by an outsourced head of internal audit. And last year, those reports included a review of communications, a review of our compliance with GDPR, and a review of the role and functions of the senior management team. Um, we also give some detail on our approach to the identification of risk and risk management, and in pages 24 to 26 of the report, we identify key challenges and the risks and focus, and we do have quite a big focus on that, on the impact of COVID, which has obviously been a significant challenge for everybody, including us. Um, I am pleased to report to committee that there were no significant internal control weaknesses identified in the office's systems of internal controls that affected the achievement of either our strategic objectives or our good governance. Um, our internal control system is designed to ensure that appropriate methodologies, principles and policies for the office, including a code of conduct, are in place. And I am committed to addressing any governance weaknesses and to introducing any enhancements or improvements have, that can be identified. But having considered all the recommendations made by internal audit and reviewing our criteria against managing public money in Northern Ireland, there weren't any significant issues identified. Good governance, risk management, robust internal controls remain really prominent on both the ARC agenda and the SMT agenda, and also very prominent in terms of my own personal um, commitment to delivering on those. So I'm happy to have that conversation with committee. I would maybe just ask John now if he would update yeah. on the financial elements. John, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Margaret and committee. Um, just following on from what Margaret has said, the, the accountability report also includes our remuneration and staff report, which discloses pay and pension entitlement for each member of the senior management team, as well as uh, payments to our audit and risk committee members. And also uh, it provides information on our overall staffing numbers and ex related expenditure. Just on that, our staff numbers as, a, as at the end of 1920 were 47 in terms of headcount uh, compared to 46 a year earlier. In average whole time equivalent terms, those numbers translate to 41 and 38 respectively. Uh, the accountability report further includes at pages 46 to 49 the, the Comptroller and Auditor General's certificate and report. And I'm pleased to say that that reflects uh, an unqualified opinion on our accounts. In other words, a clean bill of health. So then moving on to the final section that Margaret pointed to out, the um, from page 49 onwards, we have the statutory financial statement setting out our, our income and our expenditure for the year, stating our assets and liabilities and noting our cash flow and, our, and the movements in our financial reserves, together with the related accounting policies and the notes to those accounts. I think of particular note here is... is is the achievement in 1920 of a, a low level of underspend, 1.5% against our budget, uh, which, is, which is well within the conventional target of a maximum of 2%. We think that that's indicative of, of strong financial management and 
it's, I think, maybe particularly noteworthy given that towards the end of the year in question, uh, we were landed with COVID-19, <coughs> excuse me, COVID-19 and a lot of other events over the course of the year that made accurate financial forecasting that bit more difficult. So that that's a run, a quick run through our annual report and accounts, and uh, we would be we-, we would welcome any questions that now that the committee may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Marcus. Um, with the, if you agreed, we'll open to members uh, for questions. Uh, I'll uh, start with Joanne Bunting. If if uh, broadcasting would bring Joanne Bunting in, please. Joanne gone, yes. Uh, bad signal. Okay, we'll uh, uh, Emma Rogan. Broadcasting bring in Emma Rogan, please. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you um, both for that um, re- report. I just have a couple of questions, probably, with regards to um, the COVID impact. Has it had much of an ability for you to be able to carry out your, your day to day functions? So yeah, the I suppose the short answer to that is it, it has affected, like um, most or all other organisations. You know, there has been an impact in a number of ways. Uh, to summarise those for us as ombudsmen, I think the the, the first one was that um, despite receiving a, a, a significant reduction in complaints received at the, the height of the, the COVID lockdown, mm-hmm. our productivity was also affected to a similar degree, and, and, and the peak it was down somewhere in the region of 40%. Now, a lot of justifiable reasons for that in relation to um, pressures of home working, homeschooling, um, general wellbeing issues, and, and, and also, to be honest, just the, the move very quickly to uh, home working as an office. Um, since then, we have had um, a period of rec- recovery. Um, you know, complaints in the door are approaching or getting back to where they were, um, or the broad ballpark over the previous year. And productivity across all three areas um, is also um, returning to to that arena. I think the other thing I would I would just um, highlight quickly, because I know time is is, is precious. But I think that the, one of the big concerns we had early on, and one that we would continue to have, is the the impact on frontline services particularly in health and social care, and their ability to um, respond as effectively and promptly to complaints at that local level. That's something that we have proactively monitored carefully and will continue to do so as we move on, because clearly that not only has an impact on our own operations, but that has um, a huge impact on citizens and complainants in terms of speedy redress of their issues. Okay, Emma, are you content? Yeah, okay. Uh, Alan Chambers? Broadcasting, bring it on. Yeah. You're on mute, Alan. Hi, Todd. Lovely. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, probably people at the moment have so many th- other things on their mind that they're, they're, they're maybe not uh, stepping up to make the usual level of complaints uh, to the Ombudsman, but uh, does the office anticipate that uh, as we come out, and hopefully we will come out of this virus uh, soon, that there will be a surge in uh, in complaints when people start to reflect on maybe how they, they have been treated by, by various authorities uh, uh, during the uh, pandemic? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, thanks, Alan. I, I think that is something that the office is anticipating will happen. Um, we have started to see just in the very last little while a number of COVID related complaints beginning to come through. Um, mm. And obviously, there is a delay because people need to go through the complaint process first before they get to us. But I think, given everything we know about the impact of COVID and, and people's experience um, of services during this time, that we do think that that's a really uh, strong likelihood for us. Um, and, and it's part of us being sure that we can respond to people on that and provide the kind of redress that they seek. Good. I don't know if you've anything for it. No, I, I think just to, to add that as we work um, closely with other ombudsman colleagues across the, the, um, the UK uh, and Ireland and, and further field actually to, to monitor 
the impact here and, and I think um, it's a similar picture. I think that people are waiting for this to come and, and trying to anticipate where those areas may be. I think there are some obvious areas that we are anticipating around health and social care, but at the moment it's a wait and see. And just referring back to that that point uh, you know, about the local complaints process I made, I think it is important for us to continue to work closely with those trusts around ensuring and monitoring that their arrangements at a local level are effective so that there's no blockage on people getting through that process to get to the Ombudsman um, at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan, is that beginning for Yes, that's me. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I should be. I have to go to my finance committee, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I wanted to ask about the level of sickness. Uh, it's reported as 6.3%, which is very good within the public sector. But it is three times what it was last year. Yeah. Yeah. So why is that? Do you want me to take yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as I think you may be reflected in there, it's on a very small number overall, which can have a huge impact. So, where there are a very small number of long term sickness absences, that can have a, a high and a disproportionate appearing effect on the overall figure. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you look at not just the year before, which I, I know you have done, but the previous years, we would have had a very similar low level. This is a spike related to um, a couple of incidents in particular. Of long term, a couple of incidences of long term sickness. Long term. And with people working at home, has that impacted at all on the sickness levels? Um, I, I would say it hasn't, to be honest. Um, I think um, well-being of people working from home has been a very high priority for us because of the huge pressures they were under. Um, there has not been any r real reported increase in sickness absence that, that I can detect. As I say, my you know, very clear impression of this spike is it's really just a small number of, of long-term absences which have now remedied themselves. Right. And uh, on the subject matter of an upward trend in the number of complaints. If COVID, for example, get, expands that further, what is your financial capability to deal with that? Well, I think, I mean, I'll ask Paul to comment too, because again, he's been there, but I think that will raise an issue for mm. us if that was to, I mean, we ha I think the office has been very effective at dealing with a rising number of complaints. And it's really important that we give a really good service to people. Mm. And if that was to go up exponentially, you know, that is something that I would feel we would need to come to committee and talk about in terms of ensuring that we had adequate resource to actually enable us to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, I think on you know, the the general kind of question or issue of this long term um, increase, which, which actually we regard as, as something of a positive in terms of awareness of the office and, and people getting access to the justice they have. But, but I think you and you'll be aware from previous evidence sessions, we have built into our processes, the systems, and approach um, a lot of proportionality. You know, we, 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 we we do you know, want to make sure that we are making the best use of and proportionate use of public funds um, to make sure the right complaints get to the um, the right answer, but also you know an increasing and strong focus on early resolution. So I think I just I just raise these as two examples of how we have responded and we would try and continue to respond, but also you know, put in a note of caution that you can't do that forever because then you get into very difficult areas where you're looking at the threshold of complaints of what can come in. So again, at that point, as Margaret says, that would be something to come back to this committee to have a discussion on, I think. And on the subject matter of how swiftly complaints can be dealt with, what does your report tell us about your output on that for the year in question? So I think it tells you a number of things. I mean, I, I think that it tells you that there are the majority of complaints that I think we deal with early and well and within the timescales. We do have a number of, so when we're doing that bigger investigation, sometimes they do take longer than we would necessarily. So what's your average turnaround? Oh, it's actually more difficult than that, isn't it? You can't. So I think when, where we gave you before the breakdown of the statistics and the breakdown of the different elements of how we deal with complaint, because that was one of my questions um, when I took up post was what was our average turnaround, and it's not actually. But is that possible. not that's not in your report? But the, I think the 
when you look at, uh, Margaret mentioned the KPI figures, and when you look at KPI 3, so KPI 1 and 2 would be the early stages of initial assessment and assessment. Um, very strong performance there on a kind of year to year basis, where you know, a significant number of complaints are closed within 10 weeks. That's the, that's the, the, the KPI for KPI 1 and KPI 2, and most complaints would be one way or another closed within that. Investigation is the complex, um, the serious, the ones that do require a greater degree of procedural fairness and reporting and, and, and checks and balances and evidence to go into that. The KPI performance there, off the top of the head, uh, is 60%, I think, last year against uh, a, a think figure. In the eight, of seven, I think. Against that of 70. And so that is 12 months from receipt and acceptance for investigation. Um, so you're falling a bit below the target. Yes, we, we we have there, and that's something we continue to monitor, in a number of ways. How does that compare with previous years? I think it's actually below where it was a previous year, but I don't have that to hand. I would be happy to we'd be happy to furnish that to the committee. Um, it does fluctuate from year to year. It depends on a number of, of factors each year. I think last year we did issue the highest number of cases yes. at that final stage than we have right. any year since Nipso's inception. Yeah. Okay. Thank All right, you. Jim. Sure, I'm going to have I just have a few questions, and then we'll be and, uh, on uh, page 26 of the annual report, which is 106 in the, our meeting packs. There's mention of considerable increase in the cost of temporary staff during 1920. Uh, thank you, Jim. 108,123 uh, from 25,941 during 1819. What is NIPSO doing in order to minimise this in future years? Sorry, which page was that, Daniel? I like, whoa. I should ask John to comment. It's page, page 26 <laughs> of the report. Of 36. The, so 26, yeah? 36. 36, 36 sorry. That's what I can 36. Find it. I understand. I was like, I can't see it. Type of mine. Um, I'm happy to come in on that if, yeah. if, if you all can hear me. I do. Um, the, uh, again, I'll just go back to the narrative around that on, on page 36. Um, the, we did experience during the year um, a, a higher than average number of instances of maternity, first of all, but also as previously alluded to in, in, in our discussion on the level of um, sickness ab absence because of two in particular long-term sickness absences that in, that obliged us to uh, engage some temporary agency resource as well. Uh, when, when someone's off sick, you cannot uh, make a decision to commit to a long-term recruitment. So very often we find ourselves in a position where we need to bring in a uh, temporary resource. And it's a combination of both some additional instances of long-term sickness and also one or two episodes of, of maternity, which obviously is, is, is going to happen every year. But given our, our uh, staff numbers, those types of phenomena can, can lead to a an apparent increase from one year to the next. Okay, thank you, John. That's very helpful. Um, just a final point. Uh, NIPSO corresponds on the October monitoring round, page 169 if I the um, of our meeting packs indicates that NIPSO will be making a return for the January uh, monitoring round. The committee will consider this obviously in due course, but can, can you assure members that uh, if you are doing this, uh, do, if, if you are doing enough to minimise the possibility of such returns so late in the financial year, John again. Yes, John again. Yeah. Just to pick up on yeah, the um, and then I need to talk a little bit about the process we've done. Yeah. Yeah. We we in, at each monitoring round, which are typically June, October, and and January in recent times, we we look carefully at our, at our forecast position. This year, um, in June, with the level of uncertainty at that point in time, we, we had we saw absolutely no basis for making any alteration to our budgetary position. And again, at, at October, uh, we had carefully considered it again, and there were again no there was no scope. We, we're now afresh looking at it as we approach two thirds to, to three quarters of the way through the year. We we now have a clearer view, but it's it's a particularly in the times that we have been in this year, it's 
it's particularly difficult to to make robust and accurate forecasts of our expenditure requirements. So we are planning to use the the December stroke January opportunity to get it as close to the mark as we can. And uh, it's a it's always a difficult exercise, and I think in this year it has been made all the more difficult by the times that we're in. Maybe yeah, just to say, Daniel, we have just um, done an entire review of where we are. So we had a special SMT meeting okay. and actually went through every element of that. Um, partly, to be honest, to ensure that we did use the financial resources yeah. that we had to meet the need and deliver the public service that mm -hmm. we are actually tasked to deliver. So that was another reason why we've just completed that exercise. Okay. No, that's grand. I think it's entirely understandable. Thank you very much. That, that's all the questions we have. But uh, Margaret, I hope you're settling well and do your role. Thank you. Uh, and I'd also like to publicly thank Paul for the work uh, that he's done uh, prior to you stepping in, uh, and also to wish you very well, Paul, in the future um, in your in your new role. And hopefully everything goes much. well. But yeah. I just want to thank you for all your work and efforts over the last, certainly since my time on the committee. Thank okay, you. thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay. Was that a major? No, not yet. Um, okay, the next item of the agenda is the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission. Uh, it's a research briefing. Um, and refer members to the comparative research paper in, uh, on uh, in-year audit committee scrutiny, which is at pages 135 to 148 of our meeting packs. And can I remind you all that the, uh, this paper was commissioned in order to reach a committee decision on an Assembly Commission proposal that this committee's view should be sought for additional in-year scrutiny in the event of an under slash overspend uh, filling outside, falling outside uh, of an agreed threshold. The threshold proposed by the Commission is 10%. Uh, can I welcome uh, Rachel Keyes, a research officer, to brief us uh, on the in-year audit uh, committee scrutiny. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Rachel. If you would uh, give us some introductory remarks and we'll probably fire a few questions. Your way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so, as you know, and I'm sure it was part of the introduction, the Assembly's Audit Committee has a role in scrutinising the draft budget of the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission. The Commission proposed that the Committee should be consulted for additional scrutiny in the year only in the event of an underspend or overspend falling outside of an agreed threshold, and the Commission has further proposed that the threshold be set at 10% of its agreed budget. The Committee commissioned RAIS to compile research on common practices across comparative legislators in this area. And the Committee noted its interest in in-year budget scrutiny practices and also um, any existing thresholds that may be in place and if the proposed threshold of 10% is appropriate. It's important to note at the outset uh, that the research did not uncover any thresholds concerning in-year committee engagement. However, a number of interesting findings did emerge which may be of interest to the Committee. Section 1 of the paper gives a brief overview of the Commission's budgeting process and presents the Budget Setting Process, MOU, the contents of which was discussed at the committee meeting on September 16th, and in particular it proposed the following. The submission of the Commission's contribution to monitoring rounds in the spring supplementary estimate will be subject to agreed thresholds between the Commission and the Committee. If these thresholds are, are not exceeded, the Commission will not seek the Audit Committee's view on its in-year position. And as I mentioned, the Commission has proposed a threshold of 10%. Sections 2.1 and 2.2 of the paper present some general advice regarding committee scrutiny, including in-year committee scrutiny from the OECD, the Department of Finance and the RHR inquiry. So the OECD has published a framework which includes good practice principles relating to budgeting and public expenditure. And they state that Parliament has a fundamental role in authorising budget decisions and holding government to account. They further state that the government should provide an inclusive, participative and realistic debate on budgetary choices by offering opportunities for the Parliament and its committees to engage with the budget process at all stages of the budget cycle. The Department of Finance issues annual guidance on the in-year monitoring process and the guidance states assembly committees have an important role to play in the scrutiny of de de departmental spending plans. For that reason, departments must ensure that they engage fully with their assembly committees in respect of the in-year monitoring process. 
However, the guidance also states that the extent and timing of this engagement is obviously a matter for individual committees, and there should be early engagement with committees in order to establish their requirements, and the Department of Finance recommends that committees should be kept informed of financial matters on an ongoing basis. Advice from the RHR inquiry was more general, but it included a general um, move towards increased committee scrutiny. REA has contacted dedicated research services and scrutiny units and other legislators in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland to ascertain common practices there. Section 2.3 of the paper then outlines these common practices regarding in-year committee scrutiny and any applicable variance thresholds that may be in effect. It's important to uh, remind the committee at this stage, um, before I discuss uh, percentages, that the overall budget allocation for the Commission for 2020-21 was approximately 40 million, so it's quite a small budget. Um, so I'm going to briefly outline the typical approaches in Westminster, Wales, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. Firstly, in the House of Commons, departments are responsible for producing main estimates and supplementary estimates, and each estimate must be accompanied by an explanatory estimates memorandum. The House of Commons Scrutiny Unit has published guidance on the content of the memorandum, and the mem memorandum is sent to both the relevant select committee of the House of Commons and the House of Commons Scrutiny Unit. Within the memorandum, departments must explain in detail any variances which are either greater than both 10% and 10 million, or greater than both 5% and 200 million. And the guidance states that explanations of variances should genuinely describe the causes or drivers of variations and their likely impacts. It is not acceptable to state what has happened without explanation or to describe solely how changes have been funded. Moving on to Wales. The Senate's Finance Committee and the Welsh Government have an agreed budget protocol, and within the protocol, it highlights the need for tra transparency of in-year movements. The Welsh Government lays two supplementary budgets per year. It further explains that if a supplementary budget is not required, the Finance Committee is to be notified in writing, with an explanation of why it's not required. If no supplementary budget is published towards the end of the year, the Finance Committee is to be provided with a written report of any variation to include an explanation of any significant budget transfers, but they haven't been quantified. Mm -hmm. An official from uh, Senate Research has confirmed the requirements of directly funded bodies. If directly funded bodies are going to submit a supplementary budget, we ask them to notify the committee so that it can be considered before it's wrapped up in a Welsh Government supplementary budget. The committee will generally discuss the request in private and then write to the relevant body. The official noted that a directly funded body would be expected to lay a supplementary budget only if the overall spending requirement was to be increased. The committee would not be informed of an underspend. So now I'll talk about the Scottish approach. In Scotland, there are two opportunities to amend the budget as the financial year progresses, the autumn budget revision and a spring budget revision, and this year there was an additional summer budget revision due to COVID-19. During a budget revision, the Financial Scrutiny Unit within the Scottish Parliament's Information Centre provides a briefing to the Finance and Constitution Committee on the proposed changes detailed in the budget revision in order to aid committee scrutiny. They the briefing typically highlights movements that exceed £5 million. Outside of the Finance and Constitution Committee sessions on the in-year budget revisions, subject committees are encouraged to take a more year-round approach to budget scrutiny, but an official from the Finance Scrutiny Unit noted that this is generally ad hoc and quite limited. Section 2.4 of the paper provides specific information relating to the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, the SPCB, and this is the equivalent of the NIAC. Similar to Northern Ireland, it's possible that not all members will claim their full entitlement every year, resulting in an underspend for this part of their budget. However, the SPCB can apply these budget underspends to fund other projects without formal approval of the Finance and Constitution Committee. The reallocation of budgets across expenditure lines is approved by SPCB's Strategic Resources Board, which is made up from members of the senior management team. However, this approach only applies to budget underspends against members' costs. Any budget underspends remaining at year-end cannot be carried forward. 
In addition, there's a written agreement between SPCB and the Finance and Constitution Committee on the administrative arrangements relating to the scrutiny of its annual draft budget, which includes the following statements that the SCPB has agreed to keep both the committee and the Scottish Government informed of any substantive changes to the Scottish Parliament's budget. It's interesting to note that Wales had a similar arrangement regarding underspends relating to members' costs. However, an inquiry took place in 2017, and going forward, Wales must surrender underspends to the Consolidated Fund, which is similar to what we do in Northern Ireland. So turning to the Republic of Ireland... In-year financial scrutiny is relatively ad hoc and has no formal rules. The committee secretariat does, and I quote, encourage committees to examine the position at least once mid-year, but this guidance is not strictly adhered to. In Ireland, however, committees must consider any excess in spending through the supplementary estimates process, and this process consider, considers any movements of more than €1,000, so technically they have a threshold of €1,000. There is a parliamentary budget office in the Republic of Ireland and they have undertaken to provide additional analysis of expenditure over or under profile by 5% and or 10 million euro. And then these findings are investigated further if it's appropriate to do so. So to conclude, the OECD Good Practice Guidelines and guidance from the Department of Finance and RHI emphasise the importance of committee engagement throughout the budget cycle. However, research concerning in-year committee engagement in other legislators showed a varied and ad hoc approach to in-year scrutiny, and a number of examples of thresholds concerning reporting and explanation of variance emerged, including variances greater than 10% in 10 million, or greater than 5% in 200 million in the House of Commons, significant budget transfers in Wales, but it's not quantified, movements greater than 5 million in Scotland, substantive changes to the budget mm -hmm. uh, for the SPCB in Scotland, excess spending above €1,000 in Ireland, and over or under profile changes of 5% and or €10 million Euro in the Republic of Ireland. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, I, I don't have any burning questions, but the other members might have. Uh, Al Chambers? I'm fine, thanks, Chair. Sure. Uh, Chair, thank you. Did you get that right today? That it's, good <laughs> <news>. <laughs> uh, it, it's a a lot of the information that I can very informative. It kind of speaks for itself, and we've scanned through. So we're happy enough. But obviously, with COVID, the budgets are affected. Um, uh, and, and just in relation to the assembly, um, what has been. In what way has the in-year budget been affected in terms of, I suppose, resourcing the building for COVID? Do you, do you know? Um, COVID allocations are dealt with separately to start okay. with, um, but there was additional in-year flexibility um, that was announced at the start of the year. Of um, you could move a million, anything under a million pounds um, between uh, budget between subject areas, um, and that additional flexibility was carried over into the October monitoring round as well. Okay, and in terms of uh, in-year costs, so for instance, I know there's been more strategic projects around the replacement of the telephone system in the internal of the building, and also the need to update the television system. Mm -hmm. I see the telephones have been installed and very good. Yeah. Uh, the cost of the, has the project been initiated, or has there been a costing done for the cost of the new um, TV system? I don't actually have any information on the okay. specifics of the budget. Okay, no, that's grand. Listen, uh, uh, that's very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate it. And thank you. Um, we're down to three members, so the other two are away. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, members. We'll move to the uh, next item of the agenda. Um, it's a letter from, it's correspondence, sorry, we consider correspondence, a letter from NIPSO uh, regarding the review of governance, uh, TOR, in terms of reference. Uh, refer members to 10.1, pages 150 to 151 of the members' packs. And can I ask members to note the correspondence, seek an agreement to issue a response to NIPSO indicating that the time scale for the review will be circulated in due course. Uh, this time scale could be finalised and published in the committee web pages in due course. All agreed? Okay, thank you. 
Can I refer members to pages 152 and 153 of the members' packs and ask members to note the correspondence? It's the NIPSO quarterly bulletin for winter 2020. Okay, and uh, also um, there's a memo from uh, procedure, the Procedures Committee with the hybrid proceedings. I refer members to pages 154 and 155 of the members' packs and ask members to note the correspondence. Can I also ask uh, members to consider the letter from NIPSO, uh, read the follow up information, I refer members to pages 156 and 16 to 163 of the members' packs, ask members to note that correspondence. This correspondence will be included as a part of the committee's report on the NIPSO draft budget for 21 2022. Um, there's also a letter from the NIAO uh, regarding minutes um, and October monitoring rounds, I refer members to pages 164 of members' packs and ask members to note the correspondence. Um, also, a letter from the CNAG, the Public Accounts Committee, um, re uh, the budget query, I refer members to 165, 166 of members' packs. I can inform members that this correspondence was considered by the Public Accounts Committee at its meeting on the 5th of November, uh, at which time the committee indicated that it was content with the response. Uh, the correspondence will be included as part of the Audit Committee's report on the NAO uh, draft budget for 21 22. Ask members to note the correspondence. Um, also, a letter from CNAG uh, regarding the review of the Governance of Terms of Reference. Refer members to page 167 of the Members' Pack and ask members to note the correspondence. Further, uh, correspondence uh, in form of a letter from uh, the NAEO uh, and your report and accounts and refer members to 168. Can I ask members to note the correspondence? The updated copy of the NAEO and your report and accounts will be included as part of the committee's report on the draft. NAO Budget 21-22, um, and also uh, a letter from NIPSO regarding the October monitoring round. Bear members to 169 in the members pack. Ask members, can I ask members to note the correspondence. This matter uh, may have been addressed during earlier session on the NIPSO annual report. Uh, it was on this occasion. Yeah. And also, finally, um, can I refer members to correspondence regarding the NIAC annual report and accounts? Pages 170 to 275 has members to note the correspondence, uh, and also uh, an update from the NAEC on the October monitoring round. Refer members to 118, 119 of the members' table packs, uh, and can I ask you to note that correspondence? And given the information submitted in relation to the October monitoring rounds, can I uh, seek agreement from members that information from all three non-ministerial bodies is sought in respect of the January monitoring round? All agreed. There's a lot in that. Okay, just any, uh, yeah. Can we uh, refer refer back to the research paper uh, in, in relation to the NIAC and the uh, presentation just given to us? Can I seek agreement? Um, can I seek agreement from members to share it with the NIAC? Is that okay? Yeah, these are all gone yeah, silent. Bad. Okay. Um, okay, next order of business. Uh, any other business? No. Um, the date time uh, of next meeting uh, is to be held on the 9th of December. A short meeting may be required uh, thereafter to agree the committee's report on the draft budget for 21 2020. The Secretariat will advise members of this date in due course. Okay, thank you, members. I'll see you thank you. next meeting. Okay, thank you.